All right, we're two after, so we'll begin. Thank you for joining us today. Again, I'm Andrew Conley with Clean Fuels Ohio. This is the session on our Ohio Green Fleets program and Green Fleet experiences. I wanna thank you all as attendees for joining us live now, as well as our great panelists for participating with us. We have John Hyatt from the city of Dublin, Marcus Elliott and Vicki Miller from the Columbus Regional Airport Authority, all here to talk about their varied fleet experiences as well as their participation in the Ohio Green Fleets program uh, for a number of years. Uh, wanted to make a couple quick housekeeping announcements. First off, uh, the conference, the 2020 Midwest Green Transportation Forum and Expo is being brought to you via the Whova app. Um, so you were able to log in there to connect to this panel, but make sure to set up your profile and look at all the features of that app. We do have virtual exhibit hall, a lot of ways to connect with your peers and experts through the conference. All of you attendees are currently in listen only mode. Uh, we would like you and encourage you to chat questions to us throughout the, the panel here. You'll see if you hover over the bottom of your Zoom application, there is a Q&A uh, feature. So please feel free to chat questions in, to us and we will reserve time at the tail end of this panel to address your questions and, and talk those through with you. Um, with that, I will uh, provide the basic agenda that we're gonna cover for this session. So today, um, Obviously, that was the welcome and intro. I'll provide a brief overview of Clean Fuels Ohio and, and our work and mission as a nonprofit. The bulk of what I'd like to present on the front end is information about our Ohio Green Fleets program, how it works, and what some of the benefits of participating in the program are. And then, so you don't have to take my word for it, I want to uh, talk with our panelists about their experiences. Uh, the fleets on the call today have been working with Clean Fuels Ohio since 2009. Uh, our Green Fleets program launched in 2008. So both are five star, the highest rated Ohio Green Fleets and excited to hear uh, from them. And then we'll have a brief moderated conversation with our assembled panelists and take your questions and answers. So with that, uh, for those of you who don't know us, Clean Fuels Ohio, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Our sole focus is on the transportation sector, focused on making Ohio a cleaner and more prosperous state by working on the portfolio of available efficiency and alternative fuel technologies. So we are fully uh, neutral or agnostic here to work on the slate of options that's commercially available and figure out the options that make the most sense for a variety of, of fleet operations. We are part of the Department of Energy's Clean Cities Coalition Network. And if you take a look at our agenda over the next two weeks of this Midwest Green Transportation Forum, uh, you'll see a number of my peers uh, from all the different regions moderating a lot of the sessions and participating as expert panelists uh, throughout the event. So there are a number of coalitions spread all throughout the country. So if you do represent a fleet that has operations beyond Ohio, we do have peer organizations elsewhere throughout the country and a growing number of them are offering uh, green fleet programs. They might not be named green fleets in, in particular, but uh, they have a variety of recognition uh, programs as well throughout uh, the different uh, regions. So Clean Fuels Ohio's Green Fleets program was launched in 2008. So um, we've been going strong for 12 years. And the real uh, intent of the program was to provide several core things to our fleet partners. The first is to educate and advise. Uh, one of the core functions of Clean Fuels Ohio, as I mentioned at the top, the Green Fleets program is really a locus and an umbrella over uh, a lot of our education uh, activities. Second, uh, once folks are educated and have analyzed and, and planned, uh, our goal is to leverage funding to support their deployment activities. So 
We've had a lot of historic efforts and partnerships with a variety of fleets, including those on the call today, who we've worked with to assist in applying for funding from various programs to, to fund the vehicles and station technologies that, that fleets are looking to deploy. Our overall goal, as our uh, mission uh, suggested at the outset, is to improve air quality and energy security by uh, providing uh, assistance in deploying energy efficiency technologies to reduce the amount of fuel that's being used, as well as a variety of cleaner, domestic, more sustainable alternative fuels to displace the amount of petroleum that's being used. And then finally, um, fleets who have achieved all these things, our goal is to provide recognition of fleet leaders. Uh, one of the core things that the Ohio Green Fleets program does is uh, enroll fleets, gather baseline data, and quantify fleet improvements across a variety of metrics, which I'll get into in a moment. So with that, I wanted to just touch on those four areas and, uh, and provide a little more context about what the Green Fleets program does and, and how we work with our fleet partners. Again, the, the Green Fleets program is completely free. So we work with partners on, on all these areas and do our best to make these free resources to help spur adoption with our fleet partners. So in terms of education, we try to focus on three core areas. The first are events, uh, general type of learning events focused on a whole variety of fuels and technologies and events uh, have taken the form of small group meetings, uh, workshops, webinars, day-long conferences and, and training seminars, uh, so you name it. In addition, we provide technical resources. This uh, largely consists of fleet analysis and planning type services, as well as some other technical resources that I'll mention in a moment. And then another key aspect of what we do is fleet success stories. So the, the recognition element is a key part of that, but also one of the things we've found matters the most to fleets is connecting with peers, uh, not taking my word or anyone else's word for it, but um, connecting with peers who have had success who you can share experiences with. So in terms of events, I did mention, you know, his, his, pictured here historically, you know, we hold large conferences like this one that we're here today, the Midwest Green Fleet Green, Green Transportation Forum. Uh, we've held in person for the last number of years, obviously holding virtually now. Uh, we do a number of education days at the State House. We do uh, large ride and drives, which you can see pictured, uh, expos, all, all kinds of things. So. Our goal is to connect fleets with the resources and the experts that, that they are interested in connecting with. So for any of you on the call, we are very interested in your feedback um, as we move forward, if there are resources or connections that you are looking for. Um, so we're, we're constantly trying to refine our events to make sure you get the education, networking, and connections that benefit your operations and goals the most. In addition to that, on, on the Ohio Green Fleets program, as I mentioned at the top, we are completely fuel and technology neutral. So we're not here representing any specific industry vendors or any specific fuel type. Our goal is to understand your operations and goals and work with you to provide resources and assistance that helps you meet your goals in the most uh, cost-effective and operationally effective ways. So in that regard, um, some of the technical resources uh, through the Ohio Green Fleets program are analysis and planning services, working with fleets to look at what is your replacement cycle, when are you buying vehicles, what are your goals, and how can uh, various efficiency technologies and alternative fuels be um, integrated with your capital budgets and replacement plans to lead to the successful outcomes that you're looking for. We work a lot on grants and incentives, providing uh, a variety of resources, and I'll, I'll touch base on that in a moment. And then a number of technical trainings. One of the things we've done recently, obviously, all this conference uh, counts, uh, you know, in the in the framework of technical trainings. But we've also partnered with a number of folks recently. Marathon Technical Services on 
uh, fire safety trainings and um, a variety of trainings around maintenance facilities for gaseous fuels, whether those be uh, propane, natural gas, hydrogen, et cetera. So a lot of activities there. And again, we're open to your feedback and interested in, in what fleets need to help provide those uh, resources, those technical resources. And then I mentioned peer successes. So we're always trying to grow the catalog of fleet successes. Um, we work with the Department of Energy every year on an annual report to report on the number of gallons of fuel and technologies that are being used in the state. And we have a whole host of uh, print, web, and video resources. What you're seeing here is just a brief snapshot of our uh, Clean Fuels Ohio uh, YouTube page where you can see we have you know, a whole set of videos, number of different playlists around different fuels like propane, biodiesel, natural gas efficiency, you're dividing things between uh, public fleets versus private fleets and um, vehicles versus infrastructure. So our goal is again, to connect peers with peers for the best learning uh, and resources and outcomes. So I mentioned grant funding. One of the big things that we do after working through education and analysis and planning is to support folks on grants and incentives uh, around the fuels and technologies they want to deploy. Uh, this takes the shape of a variety of webinars and uh, guidance and summaries on best practices of how to apply and be most competitive for, for different uh, grant programs. Uh, this summer we uh, have hosted webinars on the Ohio VW program around vehicle uh, grants and historically been very active on a number of different uh, federal, state, and local funding opportunities. In addition, we do uh, competitiveness vetting um, and we do uh, grant writing services for our members and, and for um, folks who want to contract with us to take the whole grant off their paperwork off their desk. Uh, we also do uh, grant administration and reporting if that's something folks are interested in. But historically, uh, the, the three biggest sources that have had funding for fleets in Ohio are the US EPA, the US Department of Energy, and the Ohio EPA. While we've also worked with um, CMAC through the metropolitan planning organizations like MORPC, NOACA, OKI, and et cetera. Uh, but these have been the three biggest sources of funding year to year um, for, the, for the duration of the Ohio Green Fleets program. And since 2008, when we've launched that program, we've had a lot of success sec securing over $100 million in funding for a whole host of um, fleets that includes both uh, funding for alternative fuel stations, as well as vehicle uh, conversions and replacements. Uh, so um, our fleet partners on the call today will be discussing some of our historic work with them in this regard. And then again, the whole goal is to improve air quality and energy security. So, uh, you know, that hundred plus million in grant funding, uh, you know, has gone towards implementing and deploying a host of alternative fuel stations. So you can see um, these are, uh, majority of these are publicly available locations uh, for a range of alternative fuels. Not all of those have been grant funded, but a number of those have uh, been assisted with a variety of grant funds. That means that we have a lot of alternative fuel throughput in the state of Ohio, but there's always room to grow. Um, this is uh, information that we helped the Department of Energy compile over the last year. Uh, you can see 25 million gallons of variety of alternative fuels. You can see uh, some of our biggest fleets, refuse fleets, um, transit bus fleets, and um, some of the large um, class eight tractor trailer operations are using natural gas. So you do see natural gas historically has been the biggest uh, share of that um, that pie, but all the variety of alternative fuels are also growing uh, from year to year. In addition to that, the goal is to uh, improve air quality and health through not just using alternative fuels, but reducing the total volume of fuel that's being used as well as um, deploying a range of other options. Uh, so you can see there um, emissions reduced in that first pie, 
you know, we're tracking emission reductions through a, a huge chunk of alternative fuel vehicle deployments, as well as fuel economy improvements, idle reduction improvements, um, electric and hybrid vehicles, and vehicle miles traveled reductions. So you can see kind of the bigger pie on the in the middle there on all those different pathways and solutions as well as the the right hand side that's focused just on those uh, alternative fuel uh, propulsion technologies fuel technologies so our goal is to reduce those emissions uh, and deploy those uh, greater efficiency technologies and alternative fuels and then to recognize leaders who are doing all that including those uh, uh, fleets participating with us on the call so we do that by providing free enrollment where we get a baseline of uh, data from our fleet partners saying, okay, where did you start this journey? What's your baseline data? Then we gather data on efficiency and all fuel technologies deployed. So, okay, from that baseline, did you reduce vehicle miles traveled or idling uh, by deploying efficiency technologies or did you deploy alternative fuels? And then with those, those two data sets, we quantify and certify fleets on a five-star scale through the Ohio Green Fleets program. So hopefully you're seeing how this is a full range uh, from education through analysis and planning to securing funding and then recognition. And in terms of recognition, we're tracking six key metrics here. So we're the first uh, three NOx, PM, and VOCs. Those are the some of the most harmful criteria pollutants that the US EPA tracks for human health. Um, so we are tracking those, uh, NOx being what creates smog, um, VOCs also uh, affecting asthma and smog, and then PM being that particulate matter, that black soot that comes from exhaust that's a, a known carcinogen. And we're also tracking CO2 as the major greenhouse gas, as well as uh, petroleum use and overall fuel use. So that um, reductions in petroleum to an alternative fuel by, by displacing petroleum with an alternative fuel are being tracked and then reductions in overall fuel use if you're gaining uh, some efficiencies uh, through your operations whether that's anti-idling, better routing, um, you name it. So you can see here that at various thresholds, uh, based on a uh, fleet uh, percentage calculation, how much has your fleet uh, reduced in these categories, we're certifying fleets on a five-star scale. So to date, over the lifetime of the Green Fleets program, We've certified 100 fleets that represent a whole host of different operations, public fleets like uh, governments, uh, large and small, school districts, universities, uh, private fleets like major uh, local uh, and regional delivery and trucking operations. So I um, encourage you to log on to uh, the Clean Fields Ohio website, cleanfieldsohio.org, and you can actually see a little profile on each of these fleets and, and learn what they've done or, or even check out success story videos on most of them. And so uh, to date, these 100 uh, green fleets that we've certified represent a huge amount of annual um, reductions in uh, CO2 and nitrogen oxide. And um, you can log on to the US EPA and they have an, a calculator where you can put in information like this and they uh, attempt to quantify based on the best methodologies that they have, the associated health benefits that come from these kind of reductions. So you can see that listed out here. But again, the real goal is to provide that full scale guidance and assistance to fleets from education to analysis and planning to securing funding and to ultimately to recognition for the, the leadership that, that they've performed. Um, so with that, that is giving you the context of the range of the Clean Fields Ohio, Ohio Green Fleets program. And what I'd like to do is, is turn the time over to some discussion with some of our historic fleet partners. So first up, I'd like to welcome John Hyatt, who is the interim director with the city of, fleet director with the city of Dublin. 
City of Dublin has been a longtime partner with Clean Fuels Ohio. I'd like to welcome John to talk about uh, his historic journey with alternative fuel technologies and Clean Fuels Ohio. John? Thank you, Andrew. I want to start this out. The, in 2009, we partnered with uh, Clean Fuels Ohio in acquiring a grant for a CNG station. Uh, we also modified our fleet building so that we would be compliant, be able to work on vehicles within our fleet. Our CNG fueling station opened in June of 2012. And in 2011, we purchased 42 CNG vehicles that we had converted to natural gas from gasoline. All my technicians are ASC certified in alternative fuel. And to date, the city has 64 CNG vehicles, with eight of them being snow plows that are dedicated CNG that we got through grants with partnership through Clean Fuels Ohio. We appreciate that much. And we also have seven bifuel vehicles, natural gas and gasoline. Uh, the city was just named the number three greenest uh, fleet in North America by 100 Best Fleets, in part due to Clean Fuels Ohio. They helped us acquire 10 Nissan Leafs that we use mainly as pool vehicles. And we also have uh, seven charge point charging stations citywide within city that are free to the public. Uh, I think the biggest journey and challenge in developing technology, deploying technologies, is really for us getting the end users to accept it once they drive them, once they try them. It's been no complaints since. It's been a very good ride, you could say. It's been a great thing for the city. And uh, what's next for the city? I'm looking at electric, electric trucks, hydrogen and fuel cells, and autonomous vehicles. That's pretty much the city's uh, journey in a, a nutshell. Andrew? Yeah, thank you, John. And certainly, City of Dublin has been a leader, not just with the, the fleet itself, as well as um, working with the USDOT on the uh, Smart 33 corridor and a number of other op operations throughout citywide. And I know, John, you've um, partnered uh, on the fleet side with also Dublin City Schools and have uh, work to leverage some of your fueling station with the CNG vehicles to help them get some some CNG buses. So uh, appreciate that that overview and, and John's going to stick around to talk more with us through the conversational aspects of, of the panel today. Um, but in addition to John, I also wanted to introduce uh, Marcus Elliott and Vicki Miller from the Columbus Regional Airport Authority. Uh, Marcus and, and Vicki have worked with Clean Fields Ohio on a number of different projects over the years. Uh, in back uh, similarly with uh, City of Dublin to that 2009 timeframe and due to all the things that they've deployed, they are also a five-star certified green fleet. So with that, I believe Marcus, you're gonna take it away first and talk to us about uh, your operations. Yes, uh, yes, thanks Andrew. So the Columbus Regional Airport Authority began looking at alternative fuel source vehicles late 2008. And uh, we decided that propane probably was the best option for us at the time for several reasons. Um, it's sustainable. Um, the, the cost for the, the fuel is very low. Um, we didn't have to put in a actual fueling station. We partnered with um, one of the providers. It was actually Feral Gas, and they provided the actual station for us, so that was really nice. But uh, we thought that auto gas, uh, propane auto gas, would be our best option, and so we decided to test out in late 2009 a, um, a hybrid propane shuttle bus. And then after one year, um, we worked closely with Clean Fuels on getting some grant funding, and uh, we, we did that through Clean Cities, which I think that was through the Department of Energy, and received grant funding to basically take our, our diesel buses and convert them. So uh, basically remove those from the fleet and convert um, new, five new buses into hybrid propane. Um, so they start on unleaded, but they, they just start up on unleaded and then they switch to propane to run. Uh, we did that 
and uh, then we just continued to convert our fleet, uh, work with Clean Fuels again for another grant opportunity, and we received the grant uh, for DERG or the Diesel Emissions Reduction Grant through the Ohio EPA. Once again, Clean Fuels uh, worked very closely with us uh, on getting the grant funding, and uh, we we just kept. Uh, uh, moving forward, and, and in late, I think it was late 2011, we received a, our first award from um, Ohio Clean Fuels. And I think we were at a three star because we converted close to 50% of our fleet. And then um, we were able to get our entire fleet, which is currently 25 shuttles, uh, completely converted over, and uh, we received our five star Green Fleet Award. Um, in late, I think it was late 2012. And uh, one of the biggest things that we've noticed is um, for our customers, because the airport's 24 seven, 365 operations, our buses never stop running. Uh, we, we had a lot of idling going on at the terminal waiting for customers to take them back out to our parking lots. And a lot of complaints that we had received in the past was, oh, can't you shut the buses off? They're noisy, they, it's a lot of pollution, it's smoggy down here, and that's almost 100% eliminated. I mean, you hear light noise from the buses, but the standing and, and uh, you know, dealing with the emissions that we used to deal with with the diesel buses, that, that problem's non-existent anymore. So that's been really great. And then the cost um, of the fuel, it's been tremendous. I think we saved uh, close to 200000 annually in fuel costs because we're able to get our uh, propane currently right now, I think we're at a dollar twenty-three a gallon. So, and we have that locked in. And so, um, you know, extremely, extremely cheap price for us compared to our diesel costs. And uh, it's just worked out well for us. And, uh, and it's, it's been uh, really a blessing. The maintenance on the buses are a little bit less than with our diesel. And um, it's, it's been really, um, you know, really a good process. Uh, the thing is the airport, we drive like 1.2 million miles annually with our buses. It's a lot. And, uh, and we've had little to no complaints from our customers. And uh, it's, it's been a really good, uh, uh, really good uh, process, and we really appreciate the help that uh, Ohio Green Fleets and uh, Ohio Clean Fuels has uh, have, has given us. Um, we are looking at other uh, alternative fuels, and Vicky will speak on that in a minute. But uh, Clean Fuels has also done an analysis. I want to say as recent as late 2018, and uh, they've worked closely with our fleet manager. Um, and to look at the airport's entire fleet, not just the shuttle operation, um, and uh, and has worked closely with them, and we've begun to convert some of our actual other uh, pool vehicles, um, and, and we received, I want to say, five F-150 pickups to use in our operation that are also a hybrid uh, propane uh, gas uh, mix vehicle, and so those have been working out well for us. Uh, next is is we started to work on electric and, and looking in, in that route and so I'll uh, turn it over to Vicki and she can kind of share with with you guys uh, some of the the new things coming down in the next year or so. Thank you Marcus. Um, just a little bit of background for everyone. Um, we're in the process of constructing a new Conrack facility to house our rental car agencies um, as we have it now, you can come out of the terminal, walk across the street, and get your rental car. Um, this new facility that we're in the process of building is about a mile away from the terminal, and we were looking for a larger bus that could move more people quickly so we wouldn't have to leave our customers waiting as long. Um, so... As part of the process in doing that, we wanted to look at different options that could offer as much of 100% zero carbon footprint as we could. So we went through our normal competitive bid process and we are actually in the middle of um, a contract and in the process of 
building uh, three 40-foot electric buses. Um, we contracted with New Flyer in Alabama. And with those electric buses, um, they are expected to run the majority of that operation transporting customers uh, from the terminal to the new Conrack facility once it's open, and that will come uh, probably um, early to mid-fall sometime next year when that would be fully operational. Um, there's still a lot of moving parts to this. There is a great deal of unknown right now, but it is a very exciting pro uh, process to be going through. Um, we're also, in addition to that, we're going to have two chargers that will be charging these buses overnight at the maintenance facility and then two en route charging stations. And one of the other people on the team for the electric vehicle fleet is currently working with AEP on those charging units. And in addition to the three 40-foot electric buses, we're going to supplement that operation with three 40-foot propane buses. Um, our first electric bus should be here around the end of April, beginning of May in 2021. So uh, it's very exciting. Looking forward to it and um, hoping for the best in this unknown territory. I appreciate that, uh, Vicki and Marcus, and thank you for sharing. And, and certainly you see a pictured on the slide here some of the airport's physical layout. So what Vicki's talking about is not just deploying buses, but a huge construction project that also goes along with it as they build new facilities uh, at the airport and, and reroute some of the, the traffic and everything. So certainly appreciate the undertaking that, that you all are working on there. Uh, with the, with the context that you all provided, um, what I'd like to do is now have a, a moderated discussion with you all to talk a little bit more, circle back on some of the aspects of what you shared and, and flesh some, some things out. So I know John mentioned and, and you all mentioned some, uh, you know, no, no transition process is completely uh, seamless, although you guys have been having uh, success for a number of years. So uh, I'd be curious to circle back on what were your biggest challenges as you um, began your journey into alternative fuels? Um, what were some of the biggest challenges that, that you faced and, and how did you overcome them? So uh, probably starting back with, with John to go in our order again. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we had at Dublin was we were probably one of the earlier cities to in this, the colder climate to convert to CNG. A lot of bifuel or bimetal parts were in the original CNGs and we had a lot of failures because the stainless wouldn't shrink in zero weather and the steel did. So we had a lot of leaks. Now they've taken care of that, everything stainless steel. We haven't had near the problems that we used to have. That first winter was a bear because of all the bimetal uh, steel that was in it. But other than that, it's been pretty seamless after we got past that hump. We have not had any problems with the uh, EV uh, Nissan Leafs or any of the CNG vehicles since that time. Other than that, it's just getting the buy-in from the users, getting them to understand. It's been a great yeah. savings for us owning our own CNG station, having our own supplied gas. That's what I was trying to interrupt you, but I was gonna mention that, yeah, you have the full cycle of operations, your own station, your vehicles, and then uh, you mentioned in your comments at the outset that you fully upgraded your maintenance facility. So now you have certified technicians on staff in the facility where you can maintain vehicles. Um, anything you'd wanna mention on that staffing side, either drivers or technicians in that journey? Uh, no, they've, they've been, all the technicians, my technicians anyway, that work for the city, uh, New technology, they embrace, they love learning. I've sent two of them to Oklahoma for intense training on CNG. The rest of them, as I said, are all ASC certified in alternative fuels. It's been a great journey. Uh, I know our school buses, we, we contracted with them to do their services until they get certified and they're, or get their building converted over. So we have been handling some of their maintenance for them also. 
And for context for folks listening, uh, the Dublin City Schools has a bus depot essentially right next door to your yes. fleet facility. That's so it makes for that a little easier than than some other um, setups that are more distant. Now I believe they just ordered nine more CNG buses. That's correct. Yeah, so those are yellow seventy-two passenger standard school buses for yes, um, exactly boarding K through twelve. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, uh, John. Uh, Marcus and Vicky, anything you'd like to share in terms of kind of challenges over the years and, and how you've have overcome them? Sure. So I think probably one of the biggest challenges we had at first was because it was new technology, um, our bus provider um, at that time, they were just getting into the into the, the business of dealing with it and, and maintaining those systems. And I think we had a couple challenges with the uh, fueling, so the capacity of fuel, like you know, the range that we would get with the bus um, because of the size of the tanks that we would put on our shuttle buses. And all of our tanks are on the underside of our cutaways. Uh, we don't take up any space in, inside the interior cabin part uh, or the body of the bus. So we had some challenges there. Um, we had to find the right uh, system, I think, that met our needs the best, and, and we've done that now, so those seem to be remedied. And then the other was just, uh, we were questioned about the miles per gallon versus diesel. Obviously, diesel have, having a longer range, and so we just had to figure out the best way to keep the buses um, fueled and topped off since we're, we're uh, you know, 24-7 operations. So uh, we were able to do that through some creative thinking and and using a, a position in our our uh, department that uh, was normally washing the buses is what, would also take those over at scheduled times for fueling. So those were probably the biggest, but the thing is even with the reduced miles per gallon for us versus the diesel, the customer experience was so much better and the cost savings uh, made up for that difference. Yeah, and I know, um, thinking back to the origins of you guys starting to use propane. Another thing was just some of the FAA and Homeland Security regulations around the terminal and facilities itself, siting the station uh, was, was a little more of a challenge for you than, than the average fleet who can kind of drop it anywhere behind a fence. Yep, that, can you that's talk correct. a little bit about that partnership that you have that was able to solve that? Sure, yeah. So um, based off where, where our fleet building is for, for the buses, um, we're basically uh, surrounded by two RPZs or runway protection zones. And so our initial thought is, hey, heck, we'll just put our tank right on the right on our property. And, and it, it, you know, it turned out to be we could not do that based off our proximity to the runway. So uh, we were able to partner with uh, uh, our uh, bus vendor, uh, Bus Services Inc. And and they actually had uh, room on their property to set up our fueling station. And it's less than a mile away um, from our current location. And uh, we worked between uh, Bus Service Inc. and Feral Gas. And Feral, like I said, Feral was more than happy to provide us the station, brought the station, installed the station and the pump and everything, uh, no cost to us. Yeah, Vicki, anything you want to add? Uh from from your side uh, from the electric vehicle side I'd say so far to date um, probably the biggest challenge has been which provider to go with um, there were four options to choose from it's all brand new technology from a transit bus perspective um, a, a lot of the buses are very similar with what they have to offer. Uh, so the biggest challenge so far has really been which one do you choose? Yeah, and, and certainly um, you're not alone in that. I know a number of our transit partners throughout the state like CODA and TARDA and, and others are, are in that same process of uh, looking at which, uh, which folks to choose from. Uh, beyond that, I know all of you referenced in your comments um, are historic partnerships on helping get assistance with grant funding. Uh, 
I'd be curious uh, in terms of those resources that were provided, what were some of the most helpful resources uh, that were provided, uh, whether it be uh, related to grants or otherwise? Um, obviously the money itself is hugely helpful, but in terms of the, the process to get it or other uh, resources or assistance, what would you wanna highlight in terms of benefits there? I'll go ahead and, 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 and start. Um, so, you know, when we, when we first started looking at the alternative fuels, uh, we didn't have anyone on our staff that had ever dealt with anything like this before. And uh, just the, um, you know, even, even how to go about getting uh, any type of funding. So I think just um, the knowledge that you guys provided and you kind of helped my, my former previous uh, co-worker Tom uh, with that initial process on, on what to look for, um, you know, how to fill out the paperwork, what you needed to do. It was, you know, it was, it was a huge help. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Um, anything you'd want to add, John, in terms of resources, grants, or otherwise? Uh, no, I really wasn't involved too much with it early on. I was here when all this was happening, and I, I know it was great having you guys as a partner going through all the, the paperwork and stuff. It was actually a different department at that time. We were under streets, and they handled most of the grant writing and stuff back then. But uh, with the DIRT grants and stuff, it's been great. You guys have uh, went above and beyond. That's uh, how we got the last eight CNG plow trucks, and I tell you, when you own your own CNG and you got a plow truck, it, it makes a big difference on cost of fuel. But uh, you guys, uh, even with the last VW grants, you guys have been above and beyond what you really had to do. It's much appreciated. Yeah, and certainly appreciate you all's leadership uh, through the years and, and being so proactive, uh, both of you being some of the earliest fleets using the variety of technologies that, that you're using. Uh, with that in mind, I know Vicki's already shared um, kind of what's next uh, in terms of fleet operations. I know, John, you mentioned a number of, of things as well. So I'd want to talk through a little bit more kind of where, what your vision is, where you see things going uh, in, the, in the fleet space, fleet operations for City of Dublin first and then airport next. I'm very interested in the electric trucks. Their prices have come down quite a bit, and uh, and being Lordstown up close to where we are right now, it'd be I, I see some fascinating technology coming out of there. Very interested in that, and even hydrogen fuel cells. A recent trip I had to California showed me what hydrogen. I, I really believe that's what's next on the radar. That's my own personal thought. I don't have anything to. You know, back that up. But when you see a light tower run for three days and never make a sound, just sit there and run, it's amazing. So I, I really think uh, fuel cells is going to be the next item on the agenda. And I'll probably be retired and gone before that ever happens. But I really look forward to seeing it in my lifetime, though. Yeah, Ohio has an actual surprising number of resources there. We have the Ohio Fuel Cell Coalition, the Midwest. Hydrogen Center for Excellence at Ohio State and SARDA, the, uh, the uh, transit agency uh, for Stark County, Ohio, has one of the largest uh, hydrogen fueled fleets outside of California. So they're running a number of their transit buses on that um, and still running CNG alongside. Uh, so uh, it's, not, it's not just for the coast, it is happening here in Ohio and there is a bright future there. Um, Marcus and Vicki, anything you'd want to add from the airport perspective on, on what's next for fleet operations beyond the EV buses? Sure. So I think uh, we'll continue to evaluate our new trucks that we receive, our uh, light duty pickups, but uh, definitely we're always looking at um, converting more of the fleet. I believe we could convert them all of uh, the parking and transportation fleet vehicles to, to either a hybrid or a, a completely dedicated alternative fuel, um, it, be it you know electric or, uh, or propane powered. Great, anything you'd wanna add, Vicki? 
No, I would agree with Marcus. I think that's one of the things that we want to work towards is um, something similar to how we started with the propane. We got one bus at first and tested it and tried it out. And I think we're going to eventually work into that for our regular shuttle fleet operation um, and probably start with a hybrid and uh, go from there. Yeah, and I know um, really appreciated work in, um, in late 2018 with the um, other staff at the airport in terms of evaluating the whole fleet. And I know in addition to Marcus mentioned, um, weaving in some propane pickup trucks to the fleet. Uh, there's been three EVs adopted for some executive uh, pool type vehicles. And the fleet has also started to pilot B20 for some of those behind the diesel for some of those behind the fence uh, runway maintenance operations and um, is in the process of um, working through a Ohio EPA VW grant that got some um, electric ground support equipment, um, some tugs that move the airplanes and some um, lower deck loaders for the intermodal terminal that you have at Rickenbacker. Um, really big, you know, like 8,000 pound lift that lifts into the belly of the plane. So you guys are certainly doing a lot in, in all directions and, and really appreciate your leadership on all those fronts. Uh, I do wanna mention uh, before we get to the last couple, uh, we don't have a huge number of audience questions, but before we get to those, I do wanna mention a couple of tie-ins with the upcoming content of the conference that really piggybacks off a number of things that Marcus, Vicki, and, and John have, have shared with us today. Um, in terms of some of what Marcus was talking about with the propane vehicles, we do have three additional sessions on propane vehicle technologies. Uh, one is on advances in propane autogas uh, vehicle technologies over the years, and, and Marcus has certainly seen a lot of that firsthand with evolution of the, the vehicle platforms themselves, as he alluded to, configurations and capacities and range of, of the tanks, uh, different setups for the fueling stations, including new quick release nozzles and stuff to make it more seamless for fleets. So we do have a session focused on that um, from the vehicle OEM side, the tank and fuel system side, and um, with U-Haul presenting from a public uh, retail operation perspective. We also have sessions on your fleet experience so you can hear from three other successful national users of propane um, sharing similar uh, perspectives to that Marcus shared as well as a third session on advances in renewable uh, propane uh, so some of the first um, some of the first uh, gallons of renewable propane are coming on the market so you know it's it's not just EVs are the only option for zero carbon in the future you know, the renewable propane could, could be seamlessly added to fleet operations for that low carbon. And then to piggyback on a couple of things that John mentioned um, for interested folks, we have three sessions focused on CNG vehicles, um, one focused on CNG uh, fleet experiences. So hearing from light, medium, and heavy duty users with a lot of success um, CNG vehicles, sharing similar information that, that John shared. We also have a session on natural gas vehicle maintenance experiences and best practices with uh, folks from, from Cummins and, and from the tank and fuel system side. And we also have a session on renewable natural gas, which can also be a low carbon drop-in solution for fleets that are currently using uh, compressed natural gas. Um, so really focusing on those. And then uh, to piggyback off of some of the topics Vicki mentioned, we do have a range of electrification sessions focused on both the vehicles and the charging infrastructure. Um, so we do have session uh, coming up later this afternoon on light duty EVs, as well as ones later on medium and heavy duty electric vehicles. And then we have uh, a series of panels on infrastructure, whether that be from a fleet side to support those fleet operations like uh, Dublin and the airport have, or from a um, site host for public station side, because both the city of Dublin has a number of public EV stations, as, as John mentioned, and the airport has some 
uh, within their terminal for the, the guests to the, the users who come and park and, and fly out of the airport. So a lot of good sessions where you can dig into a lot of the details about uh, everything that we've mentioned here. Uh, but before I conclude and get to the audience questions, I also want to reemphasize again, the Green Fleets program is a fleet free program that Clean Fuels Ohio offers and we are always looking for new fleet uh, fleets to work with and to recognize. Next week, we will announce and post a video of our 2020 class of Ohio Green Fleets. You know, Marcus uh, highlighted that uh, some of the, we first recognized the airport and city of Dublin in 2012, I believe for both of you, and you've scaled up to five stars, you've deployed more and more technology. So we will be announcing those uh, additional uh, class of 2020 Green Fleets next week as part of our programming, uh, as well as there um, is some connected uh, aspects of the conference where um, the 100 best fleets will um, also be announcing um, some of their winners as, as John highlighted as well. So uh, lots of good opportunities to continue to connect on all these topics and learn more from a variety of, of fleets and experts. Uh, Anything, uh, Marcus, Vicky, or John, that, that you'd want to add, or any any concluding comments from you? Um, the the only thing I would add is just uh, you know, stay keep a broad mind. Uh, not one solution is the best solution. So you know, uh, there's great solutions and and all different types of alternative fuels, and just pick the one that you think works best for you. That is certainly our perspective as well. We're here to assist with whatever helps meet your economic and environmental bottom lines. Anything you'd like to add in conclusion, John? Availability on, on what type of like natural gas or whatever, the availability is a big part of it. But also I do wanna add on our maintenance costs for our 250s and 150s, we're able to go 10,000 miles on an oil change which is a huge cost savings. And we could probably go even further, but we have to change a inline filter for CNG every 10,000. So we serve some men, but uh, the maintenance costs are really a lot cheaper with CNG. Uh, that's really all I got. And I believe Marcus, you're emphasizing the same thing from your perspective on propane as well. Uh, yeah, it's, it is cheaper than it was with diesel. And I know, Vicki, one of the main selling points for EVs is that, you know, less, uh, not, not, an, not an internal combustion engine, less fluids, less parts, less maintenance overall. It's also a major selling point on the EV yes. side. Uh, actually, that was uh, the main question we had from the audience was um, any, any more conversation or um, discussion of the maintenance costs. Uh, that, that was our major question. I guess last question to wrap up is, um, obviously drivers are no small part of the success of operations. Um, how have the drivers enjoyed the, the vehicles that they've driven to date, the alternative fuel vehicles driven to date in your respective fleets? So the, for our buses, the ride is a lot smoother um, and, and, and the noise, the, a lot of noise reduction for ours. Um, the drivers seem to like the buses fine. Seem to have plenty of power. Uh, so they've not had any issues with that. Um, like I said, the, big, the biggest thing is the, uh, is the reduction in miles per gallon, but it's still, I mean, based off the, our schedule and our rotation of buses, we rotate them in and out. Um, it's not been an issue. Great. How about the drivers from your side, John? How have they liked the vehicles? Uh, the drivers driving the Nissan Leafs love them. They're fast. They're quiet. They're very efficient. They, I have not had any complaints. In fact, some people you would think wouldn't go near them or requesting them. They are, uh, uh, we mainly use them for pool vehicles. We got a key box, but they're probably one of the most requested vehicles we have for somebody that's not working alongside the road just for transportation. They're great. And it, it's getting the buy-in on the CNG vehicles. We had a lot of complaints, say it wasn't as powerful, but you put them side by side with the same trailer, you can't tell the difference. Excellent. And it looks like the last question we have chatted from the audience is, 
uh, have you since you're both deploying multiple technologies, have you found any one system that really helps you track um, particularly expenses on the vehicle technologies? This is one of the audience questions. You know, we use ChargePoint and we have public stations. We don't charge the public, but we're able to track the expense for the city, of course. It's relatively cheap uh, with our fueling, our diesel and our regular gasoline we use EJ Ward it'll it'll do our gas and diesel for us but CNG is I guess that's EJ Ward also so we track both of them with that anything you'd want to add Marcus or Vicki uh, we also use charge point for our electric vehicles to do the tracking um, and then our uh, Vicky, correct me if I'm wrong, but what, what systems Mark are using over there for the, is that the Fleet Master? Yes. Okay, for our uh, propane system to track. Yeah, so I think that's, you know, the industry is evolving right now. There, I'm not aware of kind of a one-stop shop overall system that would cut across all fuels and technologies. There are certainly database systems. Uh, on our uh, natural gas uh, maintenance best practices, uh, we will hear from AssetWorks, who's helping track and, and work with a variety of telematics and other systems to get that all into their database uh, for a variety of fleet users. But uh, really appreciate um, the questions from the audience and the participation of, of Marcus, Vicki, and John here on this panel. We're getting close to our, our time and so I just want to thank, thank you all for participating, um, you as panelists, for um, your historic partnership with Clean Fuels Ohio through the Green Fleets program and your leadership in, in using everything from biofuels to electric vehicles to propane to, to CNG. So certainly a large mix of technologies represented here. Uh, so thank you for participating. Thank you all for, for tuning in. Uh, Again, lots of ways to follow up on this through the Whova app, um, both with networking opportunities and with a range of other sessions that are gonna dive into further details about these fuels and technologies. Stay tuned next week for our 2020 Green Fleets Awards videos that we'll be posting, as well as if, if you have a fleet and you are interested in becoming an Ohio Green Fleet or working with us in these ways, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, both during the conference and afterwards. So thank you all again uh, for joining us and for participating. Appreciate you all and hope to see you throughout the Midwest Green Fleet Forum and Expo. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you.